I was nine when I bought my first record, 123 Red Light, 1968. I grew sick of it after only a couple of days. But on the B side was a song called Sticky Sticky. It was like the weird Beatles stuff. I loved the Beatles best when they got weird. Unusual instruments, rhythms, taped effects, complex progression. This sort of thing always caught my ear more than the simple pop songs. By 13, I was into psychedelic music way before I discovered psychedelics, and I detested Top 40 radio. Through high school, growing up in Vermont, I listened to an FM station out of Montreal featuring prog rock, early electronic music, and Quebecois art rock. Meandering instrumental music, avant-garde, yet classically structured, and far beyond the simplicity of rock and roll. Ryan Eno soon became, and still is, a god in my book. I got involved with my college radio station, snagged the primo 8 to 11 Sunday spot my freshman year, and kept it until I graduated. <laughs> You're listening to the Candlelight Breeze on 90.1. WRUV-FM in Burlington. <laughs> I served up a steady diet of the trippiest and most obscure music I could find in the vast and already mildewing record library. My roommates for a couple years were deadheads. I slowly learned to tolerate the deads' cowboy songs while quickly growing to love those long second set space jams and Jerry's inspired noodling. For money... I worked at the Old Board Restaurant and Nightclub, the biggest disco in Burlington, Vermont. Disco. The scourge of the 70s. R&B and funk gone horribly awry. Today it's a retro novelty. Back then, many of us knew it for what it was, the beginning of the end of civilization, now commonly referred to as rap. When I graduated college as an electrical engineer, I punted on my fantasies of designing music synthesizers and first-generation digital audio. I needed a job, and the jobs were in computers and the defense industry. I landed a job in Indianapolis, got married, and my first son was born in 1982. MTV was new and fun to watch, but 80s new wave music was still mostly cheesy top 40 radio fare just with shorter hair and edgier lyrics. I located the hip part of town with, a cool, with the cool live venues and a great indie record store to mine for bro a broad variety of good music. I sucked up as much vinyl as I could afford. My son's first toys were mostly musical, a Schroeder piano, a xylophone, a harmonica. I would put music on the stereo and we would jam along together. In addition to the prog rock and weird electronica by now, I was listening and collecting jazz, the real stuff, not the Kenny G. White Bread shit. <laughs> I also liked the old blues and reggae, the music of my college radio friends that I had left behind and now miss terribly. In 1983, I took a new job and it took us to San Diego. A few months later, I caught a couple of Grateful Dead shows at Irvine Meadows with some co-workers, and I was hooked worse than my old roommates ever were. Through the 80s, five or six times a year, a weekend of Dead shows was within a day's drive of San Diego. So this became an occasional and cherished and chemically enhanced escape <laughs> from my suburban life and defense contractor job. My second son was born in 1985, and by the end of the 80s, it was clear that neither kid was the soccer and t-ball type. But as state-of-the-art suburban parents, you are required to find a weekend activity for your children. <laughs> My older son, Adam, loved music and was high energy. Neil was mellower, more of a Legos and Nintendo guy. We put them in a Saturday morning group piano class. Adam flamed out after a, a month. No patience for it. But Neil, he realized that this was something that he could do better than his brother, so he latched on to it. <laughs> Wouldn't let go. Still plays today, 20 years later. So we enrolled Adam in voice lessons in a children's theater group. Musicals. 
I always hated musicals. <laughs> but it was a great group of kids, and we became good friends with some of the other parents and always had fun. And thankfully, they never did Oklahoma. <laughs> when I was a kid, watching the annual airing of Oklahoma on TV was my mother's one perverse form of child abuse. <laughs> Adam's love for singing grew, but he began veering off in the wrong direction. <laughs> no matter how many cool vocalists I could turn him on to, Bowie, Morrissey, Robert Plant, even Otis Redding, he would listen to En Vogue, <laughs> Backstreet Boys, Destiny's Child. He was becoming our musical Alex P. Keaton. <laughs> At 13, he begged me to take him to his first concert. When I was 13, I remember begging my brother to let me go with him to go see Zeppelin at the Forum in Montreal. Adam wanted to go see Paula Abdul at the, <laughs> the sports arena. Yeah, go ask your mother. <laughs> in the late 90s, he discovered and got totally into 70s disco. One day I came home to Brick House, playing at full volume. I turned into my father. I stomped up the stairs and shut off the stereo and I yelled, it's totally inhumane that I'm being forced to live through this fucking music twice in one lifetime. <laughs> but dad, dad, it's cool, it's cool, he said. No, no, it was never cool, never. People only liked it that back then because there was quaaludes, the cocaine was snorted, and everyone was having sex with anybody because nobody was worried that it had to be safe yet. <laughs> he rolled his eyes and put on his headphones. I had become the painfully uncool dad. <laughs> After graduation, he enrolled in Cal State Fullerton's theater program, but that only lasted a month when he realized everything they were teaching him, he already knew. And worse, he was required to take remedial math. <laughs> math to him is like opera is to me. It's complex, important work, but it's essentially a form of waterboarding. <laughs> he got a job as a lead singer on a cruise ship, or as like we, we like to call it the lounge singer Navy, <laughs> crooning through Lawrence Welk-like themed melodies, medleys. A year later, he found something more hip, a six-month tour of the rock musical Hair in Germany. He and the rest of the cast fully embraced the sex, drugs, and rock and roll theme of the show on and off the stage. He had a blast. Back in L.A. in 2005, he landed, short, he landed short-term theater gigs and had a part-time retail job. One store offered him a full-time management position. He called and asked me if I thought he thought he should take it. I meant it meant a good salary, benefits, but very little opportunity to keep auditioning. Remembering how I jettisoned, jettisoned my passion for music in exchange for a good job years ago, I couldn't help but tell him no. Keep chasing the dream, Ad. You're only 23. This turned out to be the right answer since he had already turned the job down. <laughs> Occasionally, he called me for supplemental cash for bare necessities, food, rent, past due cell phone bills, or for camping supplies for the annual Burning Man trip, which I came to understand was essentially a run of dead shows in the desert, but without the dead. <laughs> Eventually, desperate for income, he hit his low point in Lake Tahoe in a musical version of Debbie Does Dallas. <laughs> No one in the family was allowed to come see his throwaway male lead in a cluster of tits and thongs. <laughs> Finally, he secured a solid long-running gig back in L.A. With a chorus, in the chorus of the show Wicked and started a band with some friends on the side. In August 2008, he called and said he was going to try out for American Idol. Not a big TV watcher. I had heard of the show, but knew nothing about it. He told me thousands were trying out across the country. I said, oh, okay, I wished him luck. <laughs> in October, he called to say he was in the top 40 and he was going to be on the show, but had to quit his job at Wicked. Wait, 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 wait. 
you're going to quit your best paying job ever to go on a game show? Dad, Dad, it's the number one show on television. It is? <laughs> How much are they going to pay you? Then he said, well, I don't get paid until the summer and only if I make the top 10. So how the hell do you live for nine months without income? I could see where this was going and the call <laughs> rapidly went downhill from there. In February, after I discovered what an absolute hideous spectacle the first month of the show actually was, I made, he made the top 12 and we all celebrated. Two weeks later, I missed my favorite idol performance of his and a slithering Middle Eastern version of Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire that freaked medieval America the fuck out. <laughs> After that, I committed to go up every Tuesday for the live show. We would talk on the phone every Friday about what song he was thinking about doing the next week and how he was doing. And of course, you know, all of my suggestions were summarily discarded. <laughs> the closest I got was to get him to shortlist Instant Karma for 70s week. He's saying, play that funky music white boy instead. <laughs> Stinging irony is the cornerstone of any good father-son relationship. <laughs> Over four months, I met an odd cross-section of celebrities sitting in the live audience. Paula Abdul. <laughs> Glenn Campbell. Slash and Smokey Robinson, but unlikeliest of all, the excitable pop music fanboy, Sir Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> he graciously congratulated me for having a talented son before the finale began, but 20 minutes later, a wildly exuberant Hannibal fucking Lecter is slapping me on the back and giving Adam a standing O after he sang A Change Is Gonna Come. <laughs> No amount of recreational drug use can prepare a person for this sort of thing. <laughs> Adam ended up coming in second, made the idol tour in his big payday. He released his first album in 2010 and scored a couple hits on Top 40 Radio. <laughs> he toured the US, Europe, Southeast Asia, and last year he sang with the remaining members of Queen for seven shows in Europe. Thing is, I never really liked Queen. <laughs> but I kept that to myself. And my son Neil and I flew over to see the London shows and they were great. I stopped buying records and switched to collecting CDs way back in the late 80s. But last September, I unwrapped the first brand new vinyl record I'd opened in 28 years. It was Adam's second album. And even with all that it had happened, this was an amazing moment for me. He caught the dream. The album hit number one on Billboard for a week or so, and I tuned in to the local Top 40 radio station during my morning commute and evening commute to and hopefully to hear them play his new single. But this only lasted a couple of days because that shit they play on Top 40 radio... <laughs> Still totally unlistenable. Thank you. <laughs> Give it up for Eber Lambert.